Okay, let's see what you guys think. Uh, I have to warn you that every time I read these poems, I want to cry. So if I have to pause in the middle, I'm sorry about that. Uh, question one, why does this poem begin with a specific time and place? One group chose this question. And of course, the answer depends on what is the time and place. It says it's the Hindenburg line, April 1917. And there's a footnote at the bottom of the page that explains that the Hindenburg line is a German defensive line. It's a very, very long defensive line. Um, and that for a time, so not a long time, but for a while, it blocked the Allied advance in Western France. Uh, this happened after 1916, and we know that the war ended in 19. 18. So it, in 1917, this is probably when the Allies managed to advance beyond the Hindenburg line. So this story or this poem is about a soldier who's trying to catch up with his army. And the reason he's separated is because his army has advanced beyond the line. And so he has to find where his army is. So with this specific time and place, it gives us the background. It gives us the situation. But even if we didn't know any of this, right, if we discovered the poem without the footnote, uh, according to the group who took this question, they observed that by giving us any specific time and place, it makes the story feel more concrete, more real, more powerful. If you think about the poems we've been reading throughout this semester, they've all been like from the imagination of the poet, something they're thinking about, characters they have invented. But with this time and place, it's not just the poet's imagination. It's also the reader's imagination based on what we know about that time and place. And it, therefore, it makes it feel like maybe it actually happened. It gives it a, a stronger sense of reality. Question two. Uh, the general, this poem, views death as a weapon used by officers against their own soldiers. Uh, one group took this question. Let's take a look. This is a short poem, so, so we can read through the whole thing. The general. Good morning, good morning, the general said when we met him last week on our way to the line. So on our way to the line, they are going up to fight. These soldiers have not yet fought. They're new soldiers. Now the soldiers he smiled at are most of them dead. And we're cursing his staff for incompetent swine. So the general says hello in a very cheerful way, but most of the soldiers that he greets are now dead, and the surviving soldiers think that this is because he's a terrible general, that he can't do his job well. He's a cheery old card, grunted Harry to Jack. A card is just like a bloke, a guy. So he looks happy, grunted Harry to Jack. These are two traditional British names. So like uh, in English today, we would just say John and Harry, you know, regular people. Uh, in Chinese, you would say something like. Yeah, 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 Xiaoming, Xiaohua, something like that. But he's saying it in a grunt, like in a very not cheerful way, because they know that war is not something to be happy about. So he's like, well, what the hell is he happy for? as they slog up to Eris with ri rifle and pack. Eris, the footnote tells us, is the site of a battle. So they're going up to fight. They know it's not a, a happy thing. So they're like, well, why is our general so happy? And then after a section break, but he did for them both by his plan of attack. To do for someone means to, uh, to like, to, uh, ambush somebody to do something bad to someone. Here it means that he got them killed. Uh, in Chinese, we would say xian hai ren jia. The he, the subject, is the general. 
So the poem is saying when they meet the general, he seems happy. The soldiers feel differently and they think, well, does the general really know what's going on? They start to mistrust the, their leader. And so according to the poem, the general takes revenge by designing a plan of attack that would get these soldiers killed. So the poem is giving us a picture of conflict between officers and soldiers on the same side. And the question is, why is this important? Why is it so important that the author wrote a whole poem about it? And the poem is only about this one thing, right? It's such a short poem. There's no other clear message. So why? Well, according to this group, um, it could be because this is not what we would expect from an army, right? We expect officers to lead their soldiers into battle and soldiers to support and follow their leader. But in this case, it's completely different. And this uh, is kind of like a surprise. It's a bad surprise. These poems were published in newspapers in England. At the time, there was no internet, there was no radio outside of the military. So the public got their news about the war from newspapers. And during a time of war, newspapers are not always objective. They're not always neutral. Uh, especially in Britain, I have to say in the UK, the news media supports the government very strongly. So most of the news would be supporting the war. And we're going to look at this in the next poem. Uh, most of the news is saying, oh, our brave soldiers are going to fight for truth and justice against the terrible enemy. But it's these poems that we're reading today. These are the few sources of the true situation on the battlefield. And so the poet probably thought that this situation is important enough to tell people at home to say, you think that we're all fighting together in a strong group led by competent men. Well, I'm here to tell you it's the opposite. Our leaders are shit. Our battle plans are shit and we're dying for nothing. And that I think is the point of this whole poem. It's also powerful because he uses everyday language. He didn't say he got them killed. He said he did for them. It's like slang. It's, at, it's just like a normal everyday occurrence. The language tells us this is nothing special. It happens every day. Question three, why does glory of women end by addressing a German mother? Uh, one group also took this question. Another short poem. Let's look at the whole thing. You love us when we're heroes home on leave on vacation. Or wounded in a mentionable place. So when we're wounded, you celebrate us as heroes, but only if we can say where we are wounded. It's not like in a private part of our body. So like if I lose a hand, if I lose an arm, I'm a hero. But if I can't have children, you don't talk about it. You worship decorations. By the way, the title is Glory of Women, so the you is probably women at home. You worship decorations. Decorations here means like medals, zhang zhang, xun zhang, war medals, things you get for doing a good job on the battlefield. You believe that chivalry redeems the war's disgrace. Chivalry is to act like a gentleman. Uh, in Chinese, we call this qi shi jing shen. Uh, I think we saw this word in the second week, right? The poem about the guy in a competition for the love of his life. Uh, so you think that chivalry redeems the war's disgrace. So you admit war is not a good thing, but you think that because the soldiers are all gentlemen, so in the end, it's OK. We accept it. You make us shells. 
Shells are the outer casing of a bullet or a bomb. Danke, who is a Polka. So during the war, uh, the men were all fighting. So the factory jobs were often done by women. So it was women in the factories making the bullets, making the bombs. You make us shells. You listen with delight by tales of dirt and danger fondly thrilled. So you like to listen to our war stories because they're exciting stories about dirt and danger, and they thrill you, they excite you. You crown our distant ardors while we fight. Ardor means passion. Distant because the battlefield is far away. So when we fight with energy and passion, you praise us. To crown means to like add a crown, right? You think it's the best thing. And mourn our laureled memories when we're killed. A laurel is a wreath of leaves that you put on the head of somebody to celebrate. Quick one. So you think our memories are worth celebrating when we die and you mourn our death. These two lines are parallel, right? Both the crown and the laurel are something that you put on the head. The first line is about living and fighting. The second line is about losing and dying. But in both cases, the women celebrate their soldiers. You can't believe that British troops retire. Notice the quotation marks. So this is a special use of the word retire. Usually the word retire means to take a rest. Uh, but you can tell the meaning is different from the next line. You can't believe that British troops retire when hell's last horror breaks them and they run. So here retire means to run away. Specifically, it means to retreat. Hell's last horror. The idea is that the easy stuff comes first and then the worst stuff comes later. So the last thing is the worst thing. Breaks them and they run, trampling the terrible corpses, blind with blood. So when they're running, uh, everybody is hurt and, and everybody is in a panic. Everybody is blind with blood. And so they run without looking where they go. And so they often step or trample on dead bodies, corpses. So like when you're losing a fight, you run in such a panic that you don't even notice when you're stepping on dead bodies. Oh, German mother. So now we get to the point. Oh, German mother dreaming by the fire. While you are knitting socks to send your son, his face is trodden deeper in the mud. To trod means to, uh, sorry, to tread is to trample, is to step. So you're at home, you're making socks for your son who's fighting in the war, but you don't know that your son is already dead and being stepped into the mud. So the question is, why does the poem talk to a German mother? Why not a British mother? Why talk to the enemy? One group took this question uh, and they noted that it could be a British mother. The logic is the same, right? M women at home who celebrate their soldiers, but they don't know how their soldiers suffer. They don't know how they die. Uh, the reality of war. So why focus on the enemy? Well, if it could be the same for both British and German mothers, that could be the point. It's saying even when we talk about the enemy, they also have mothers. The death of each enemy soldier also is the loss of a son. This goes back to what I was saying about propaganda. The news during the war is seldom neutral, is seldom objective. Uh, most of the time, it's always about how we are the good guys and the enemy is the bad guys, and we have to win for truth, for justice, for God, uh, for freedom. But 
in that kind of propaganda, it's very easy to forget that the so-called enemy are also human beings. That yes, every one of our soldiers that we lose is painful, but every one of their soldiers that they lose is painful also. So the point of this poem being published in a newspaper could be that it wants to remind the British people and the British women that war is not just a game for gentlemen. Like you can't believe we would lose, but you're still focused on winning and losing. You don't notice the suffering that happens that causes us to retreat. You don't notice the pain that is caused to the other side when we win a battle. You and like as it says, right? The women acknowledge that war is a disgrace. Oh, war, it's such a terrible thing. I wish we didn't have to fight. But you're just saying that. You don't really understand what that means. If you really thought that the war is a disgrace, you would not celebrate every time we win. That actually connects to the next poem, but I didn't design a question for this one, so we'll talk about it later. Question four. Do you think futility subverts traditional Christian ideas? How or how not? Uh, OK, so every year people think that this is the hardest question because most of you are not familiar with traditional Christian ideas. Uh, so let's look at this together. It's another short poem. <sighs> futility means it's useless. Move him into the sun. Gently its touch awoke him once. So in the past, the sun would always wake him. At home, whispering of fields half sown. So back home on the farm, every morning the sun would remind him that he has more farm work to do. To sow a field means to plant seeds in the field. Always it woke him, even in France. So even after joining the war, when they were fighting in France, the sun would still wake him. Until this morning and this snow. OK, so a lot of Taiwanese students misuse the word until. Until means it is no longer true. It used to be true until now means that now it is no longer true. So it does not mean 直到, it means 直到点点点才. Hmm. So when it says always it awoke him even in France until this morning, it means this morning the sun is not able to wake him. If anything might rouse him now, rouse means to awaken. So if anything might wake him, the kind old sun will know. So what's going on? What's the situation? He's dead. Um, but like calling the sun a kind old son, just it's just so painful. It's like a kind old father or grandfather looking at his grandson lying there and not being able to wake him up. Think how it wakes the seeds. The it is the sun. So think how the sun wakes the seeds. Woke once the clays of a cold uh, of a cold star. This line is talking about how the sun gave life to the earth. Star here means planet, not necessarily like an actual star, but like something in space. So it's talking about the earth. It's saying that the earth used to only have mud. But we, once the sun started sharing its energy, Earth uh, developed life. So it's like the, the sun woke the Earth. Our limbs, so like uh, arms and legs, our limbs so dear achieved, 
dear here means uh, expensive. And it's using it in the sense of an adverb. It should be dearly. Expensively. Are limbs so dear achieved? So like in order to develop arms and legs, it costs a lot. Of time, of energy. Are limbs so dear achieved? Are sides full nerved? So are a body full of nerves, like a senjing, full of feeling, full of sensation. Still warm. Are these things too hard to stir? Stir here means awaken. Was it for this the clay grew tall? Like did it did did the earth, did the sun use so much energy and effort to grow this person just so he could be killed on the battlefield? Oh, what made fatuous sunbeams toil to break Earth's sleep at all? Fatuous means foolish. If this is the end result of all of the sun's effort, then why did the sun bother in the first place? What's the use? So you can see some Christian ideas. The idea of giving life from the Earth is a Christian idea. Uh, and we'll talk about whether or not it is changed in this poem after the break.
OK, so back to the question, does this poem subvert traditional Christian ideas? Well, traditionally in the book of Genesis, it says that God created life on earth, created the earth and then created life on earth and then uh, created humans from clay, from mud. So everything in the second stanza of this poem that it says the sun does. In traditional Christian ideas, God does these things. So in that way, it's slightly different from the traditional Christian idea. In fact, it is more connected with current scientific ideas about how life began on Earth. But you can still tell that there is a Christian influence because it calls the human the clay. Uh, so this goes back to God creating humans from the clay. But this is one of the. And then you have like the sun is called a kind old sun, like a person. Uh, but worshiping the sun was not a Christian idea. It was a pagan idea. So you have religious ideas from Christianity, from other religions, and also you have ideas from science. Uh, all in this short poem. Question five. Do you think the poems by Sassoon and Owen differ? And if so, how? So we chose five poems. We talked about four of them. Uh, the first three were by Siegfried Sassoon. Futility is by Wilfred Owen. So let's read the last poem by Wilfred Owen, and then we can kind of see if there's some general pattern and general difference between these two poets. So, Dolce et decorum est. This is Latin, and it means sweet and proper it is. It's the first half of a sentence. We will see the second half of the sentence at the end of the poem. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed, which means uh, walking unsteadily. Coughing like hags, a hag is an ugly old woman. We cursed through sludge. Sludge is heavy mud. So as we're struggling through the mud, we're cursing our situation. Till on the haunting flares we turned our backs. A flare is a uh, It's something you shoot in the sky to give light. So this tells us this is happening at night. Uh, on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Trudge is to struggle through the mud. So the beginning of this story is they have finished fighting their part. They are being relieved. And so they can go back to base. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on bloodshod. The word shod is connected to the word shoe. It means to wear on your foot. So they don't for these soldiers who don't have boots, they keep walking anyway, and their blood is their shoe. All went lame. Lame means uh, not able to walk or walk well. So basically everybody is having trouble walking. All blind. Nobody can see clearly. Drunk with fatigue. They're so tired, it's like they're drunk. Actually, recently there was a study that showed that if you pull an all nighter and you don't sleep, the next day your uh, consciousness is just like you're drunk. It's exactly the same. Death even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. So they're so tired, they can't walk, they can't see, they can't even hear. They can't even hear the, the bombs falling behind them. 
a 5-9 is a kind of artillery, pa. It's a kind of bomb. And like the sound of a bomb following through the air, it, there's a whistling sound, right? So it, the poem calls it a hoot. Hoot traditionally is the sound of an owl. Maotoing the saying. So this is the first stanza. This is the situation. They're finished fighting. They're dead tired and they're going back. Gas, gas, quick boys. So gas, of course, here means poison gas. Today it is illegal to use poison gas during war. But the reason it is illegal be is because people did that too much during the First World War. Uh, and when using poison gas, you quickly realize that it's hard to control. You know, because it's gas. It's not like you can order gas to go that way, not this way. Um, so gas, gas, quick, boys. An ecstasy of fumbling. Fumbling is like holding something uh, in a hurried way, rushing, not being careful. Uh, ecstasy is being so happy that you are outside of your body. But here it's a comparison. It's a metaphor. It's saying like you, they're so hurried in fumbling for something that they don't. They're, it's not like they're inside their body. They're not in control of their body. It's a reaction. So what are they fumbling for? Fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. So they're they're trying to grab their helmets. Uh, later we'll see that these are gas masks. But these helmets are clumsy. They don't fit very well. So you can tell that these are made in a factory, made very quickly. Uh, maybe they had to control for costs. It's not something that they feel like is reliable. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Lime here is quick lime. It's something that they use to burn bodies. Floundering is like a fish on the ground, like flapping and trying to find the water. So what's going on? Someone still was yelling and stumbling and floundering. What happened? Yeah, so like they were rushing to grab their gas masks, but somebody was not fast enough. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light. A pane is a sheet of glass. So here it's saying through the mask. Uh, and the green light because the gas is usually green. As under a green sea. I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, which uh, here we would say lunge, which means like he throws himself at me. Guttering, choking, drowning. So you know drowning, you know choking. Guttering, this is a comparison. If you light a candle and the flame is being blown by the wind and it almost goes out. That is guttering. So it's describing how his life is disappearing, is going out. In fact, even today in English, uh, another word for dying is to extinguish. And extinguish usually means to put out a fire. Right? It also can mean death. So like this is the story that this person wants to tell. When, at a time when everybody was so tired, they still had to fight against time to put on a gas mask. Otherwise, they would end up like their friend, drowning in midair. If in some smothering dreams, smother means to like 
prevent somebody from breathing. Like putting a pillow on, on their face. That's smothering. If in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in. Pace here means walk. Wagon is like the, the kind of cart that you put things in. And it says that we flung him in. We threw him into this cart. If you could also walk behind and, and see his body there and watch the white eyes writhing in his face. To writhe means to like to to turn your body in pain. But here it's talking about the eyes. So it's his eyes are turning in pain. His hanging face. Like a devil's sick of sin. So it's describing his face as loose. Un, uh, out of control. It's like it's just hanging there. And it's comparing him to a, a devil sick of sin. So a, a devil's job is to create sin, right? To lead people to sin. But here it's saying that even a devil would not be able to, to accept this situation. He did, the devil is, th this sin is so bad that even the devil is sick of it. If you could hear at every jolt, so every time the cart bounced, make a dimple, If you could hear the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs. To gargle is to like swish water in your throat. Froth is just a lots of bubbles, very small bubbles. Corrupt here means destroyed. So for this dying person, his lungs have been destroyed by bubbles and the blood from his throat uh, creates this, uh, it's blocking his, his airway and it creates the sound of liquid. Obscene as cancer. So obscene usually means uh, not fit for public viewing. It's so impolite, so rude. It's obscene. And it's comparing it to cancer. Bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. Cud is what you feed a cow. But here it's a comparison. It's saying uh, sores is, uh, in Chinese we call this zi chuang, so like a, a, a damage in your skin. It's saying when you're, there's a sore on your tongue and you can't cure it, then it tastes as disgusting or vile and as bitter as the hay that you would feed a cow. And this is this image of the dead person or the dying person is being compared to the feeling of having sores on your tongue and having to taste it every day. And it's calling it an innocent tongue. You didn't get these sores because you did something wrong, right? It just happened to you. So if you could see the dead man suffering on that cart. If you could hear him make the sounds of dying. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest. Zest means energy. To children ardent for some desperate glory. Ardent means passionate. The old lie. So if you truly knew what war and death is like, you would not tell people who want to fight the old lie. What is the lie? Dolce et decorum est pro patria mori, which translated into English is, it is sweet and proper to die for your country. Sorry, another depressing poem. Um, but this, I think, is a brilliant poem for many reasons. One reason is 
it's able to use a Latin ending that fits the rhyme scheme. Yaring mei bian, right? Uh, blood, cud, lungs, tongues, zest, est, glory, mori. The line is the same even when he switches languages. And also that lie, that phrase is a very ancient phrase. As it tells us in the footnote, it's from Horus. Horus is an ancient, I want to say Greek author. So even in ancient times, they had this idea. It is sweet and proper to die for your country. Uh, but this whole poem is saying that is a lie. The reality of battle tells you it is a lie. So this is connected with the previous poem, right? Glory of women. Uh, you can't you you should remember that there is pain and suffering on both sides of war. And then in this poem, it tells you the story of one person experiencing the suffering of his brother in arms. Adanaga. Tongti. OK, so comparing the style of these two poets, what do we have? Siegfried Sassoon wrote about. Oh, we haven't looked at this one yet. OK, let's look at this one. The rear guard. Rear guard is the soldier who is supposed to be the last person. Uh, in Chinese, we call this Yazo. But the title is also ironic because he doesn't want to be the rear guard. He just got lost. Groping along the tunnel, rope means to feel your way. So like there's not a light. Roping along the tunnel step by step, he winked his prying torch with patching glare from side to side. A torch in British English is a flashlight. So uh, he compares it to a wink, zayin, because it's such a, a weak source of light. It's only one single point of light. And he calls it prying. To pry means to look into something. So he's going along a tunnel, but he can only look at certain things one at a time. With patching glare from side to side, so he's shining his flashlight left to right, right to left. And sniffed the unwholesome air. It's very unhealthy air. Tins, uh, so this is cans, probably canned food. Boxes, bottles, shapes too vague to know. Can't tell what it is. A mirror smashed. The mattress from a bed. So no bed, only mattress. And he exploring 50 feet below the rosy gloom of battle overhead. So this tells us where he is. He's in the tunnel. The tunnel is 50 feet. Um, how how many meters is that? Anybody want to convert for us? Actually, let me I want to look this up. Sorry, 50 feet in meters. 15 meters underground. Yeah, it's it's a pretty deep tunnel. And above him is a battle. But it's it calls it a rosy gloom. This is actually connected with uh, ancient Greek epic Homer in Homer. Uh, he would always call the dawn the rosy dawn. So it's it's also connected to epic poems. Tripping, he grabbed the wall, saw someone lie humped at his feet. To hump here means like to, it's like a, a, a round shape at his feet, half hidden by a rug. And stooped to give the sleeper's arm a tug, so he pulled on the person's arm. I'm looking for headquarters. No reply. 
God blast your neck. So it's a curse. Blast here means to destroy. Uh, and the parenthesis explains why he cursed the, the man. For days he'd had no sleep. So he himself is dead tired and he sees a guy sleeping there who it seems to ignore him. So of course he's angry at the guy. Get up and guide me through this stinking place. Savage. So like in a very angry way, he kicked a soft, unanswering heap and flashed his beam, the flashlight, across the livid face, terribly glaring up. So the, the sleeping guy looks up at him and his face is livid, which means angry. Glaring up, Deng Zita, whose eyes yet wore agony dying hard 10 days before. So it turns out this sleeping guy has been dead for 10 days. And it looks like he died a terrible death. Agony means suffering. And fists of fingers clutched a blackening wound. So first it describes his face, then it describes his body. His hand is clutching, he's holding his body, and under his hand is a wound, sanko. And it's been 10 days, so the wound is black. Alone, he staggered on until he found Dawn's ghost that filtered down a shafted stair. A shaft is an opening to the ground. Usually we use this word to talk about mines, Kwangkun, Kunko, a shaft. So he could see Dawn's ghost, not Dawn, but a very faint light like the ghost of Dawn, filtered down a shafted stair to the dazed, muttering creatures underground. So it's describing the underground world full of confused and muttering, not even people, but creatures, who hear the boom of shells in muffled sound. So not clearly, unclearly hear these sounds, like they're far away. At last, with sweat of horror in his hair. Horror here is not describing his feeling of, of being scared. It's describing all of the terrible things that he saw or that are in the tunnel. So because of all of these terrible things, his sweat is connected with that experience. With sweat of horror in his hair, he climbed through darkness to the twilight air unloading hell behind him step by step. So it's it's calling the underground tunnel hell. This is also another connection to Homer. If you remember in the Odyssey, Odysseus descends into hell to ask Tiresias how to get home. Uh, so the whole poem is using the idea of uh, ideas from Homer to add uh, details and add emotion to this situation. So yes, it is about a soldier who is going through a tunnel, he's lost, he tries to ask directions from someone who's asleep, turns out he's dead, and so he himself slowly finds his way. The story is simple enough, but by adding these descriptions from Homer, by adding what he sees, and the air he breathes and his emotions when talking to the dead soldier, it gives us a stronger picture. It makes this simple story seem more important and powerful. Okay, so now let's compare the style of these two poets. Siegfried Sassoon wrote The Rear Guard, The General, about soldiers fighting with their leaders, and glory of women, about how both sides suffer in war. Wilfred Owen wrote Dolce et Decorum Est, the story of seeing a fellow soldier dying of poison gas, and how that is the truth of war. 
and futility about a soldier, a fellow soldier dying and everybody uh, thinking about how it's a terrible loss and it's a waste of life. Is there a difference in style? Not really. You can say that uh, the general and glory of women are briefer and more political and more powerful. But Dolce Decorum Est is also quite powerful and it's also very political. Futility is less political, it's more personal. Um, as is the rear guard. The rear guard doesn't try to make a political point. It's simply painting a picture of this soldier underground. So, do you think the poems differ? Not too much. And the truth is that they both admired each other. They didn't know each other until both of them were injured and staying in the same hospital. Yeah. And this was already after they had published their most famous poems. Um, both of them had actually quite uh, tragic lives. So, you know, both of them were soldiers in World War One. They had an interest in literature, and so they felt it was important to share the truth of the war with people at home. Siegfried Sassoon survived the war, later discovered he was gay, and because of but because of the the contradiction of being gay in a traditional society, he hated himself for being gay and he converted from the Church of England to the Catholic Church, which is even more traditional. And he died alone and unhappy. Wilfred Owen died two weeks before the end of the war. And you know the story of their lives just adds to the power of their poetry. There was recently a movie about Siegfried Sassoon's life. It's called Benediction, Zhufu. I would show it to you, but it's two and a half hours long, and we don't have time. But I hear that it's a very good movie. You can look it up if you want. OK, question six. They're all poetry from World War I. I think that's pretty obvious. But there's also another point we can make, which is that uh, it's also connected to modernism because modernism is partly about using ancient myth. We talked about James Fraser's Golden Bough, the collection of myths, and how poets um, in the modernist period could no longer trust in a single tradition, so they had to pick and choose which part of the tradition to write about. So we just saw in the rear guard, the poem uses the tradition of Homer, language and imagery, from the Odyssey. Uh, and then, of course, you have the objective correlative. There are lots of specific details that reflect emotions, like in futility. He's talking about the sun and the earth and the farm and the snow uh, are all connected to the idea of life and losing this life. OK, so do you have questions about these five poems? OK, next week we're going to read T.S. Eliot, this guy, one of the high modernists. We're not going to read The Wasteland, Huang Rin, because that one is too hard. Instead, we're going to read what I think is the easiest modernist poem. Uh, and it's called The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Where is it? I put this one actually before the World War I poems. So next week, please begin on page nine. I say that it's the easiest one, but it also begins with Italian. Uh, but there's a footnote at the bottom to help you translate uh, this one. 
Uh, it turns out it's from Dante's Inferno. Uh, 但丁神曲的地狱篇. Now, uh, to introduce this poem, I will tell you directly what it's about, and that will help you read and understand. The main character is J. Alfred Prufrock. The name was chosen because it's a very ordinary, middle-class, boring name. And it is, in fact, a love song. Yeah, that's not a lie. That's true. It is a love song. The story is that Prufrock is in love with a woman, and he's wondering whether to confess his love. So it's a story about a crush, Dan Lin. But he's not a schoolboy. As the name suggests, he's a middle class, middle aged, middle income, very boring, average man. Not handsome, but not ugly. Not rich, but not poor, just very average. And this is the main tension, the main interest of this poem. When we talk about love, we think about like uh, beautiful and handsome people, wild passion, adventure, uh, whatever. But this story is about an ordinary, average, boring man who is in love with someone and he's thinking, should I confess my love? It, we're only going to read one poem because this one is already three pages long. Um, the language is not too hard, but it's quite indirect. Um, we have a little time left. Well, no, I should tell you about the author, T.S. Eliot. So he's most famous for being a modernist poet. He was actually born in the United States. But he later uh, moved to England because he was a very conservative person and he wanted a stronger religious faith. So he converted to the Church of England. The Church of England is a Protestant church, Sixingjiao, but it's basically like Catholicism. Uh, it's much more traditional than most other Protestant churches. Uh, T.S. Eliot politically is most famous for supporting the Italians during the Second World War. Because he's traditional, he believes in the strength of tradition. The Italian fascists, fascists, used tradition as their rallying cry, saying like, we have to defend tradition, we have to defend our country, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Eliot believed in that, so he ended up supporting the Italians. Later in life, he got a little less conservative, a bit more soft. His later poetry is full of um, forgiveness sometimes, regret sometimes, the, the idea of looking back on his life. But this is an early poem when he's still full of ambition and he still wants to, to add to the literary conversation about modernism. And so he was writing very uh, uh, detailed, complicated poems full of literary and historical allusions. So that's the background for this poem. Uh, we have a little time left, so I'll guide you through the first, let's say, one page. I'm going to skip the Italian. Well, should I skip the Italian? No, no, no. Let's look at the footnote. Because this is actually uh, quite interesting. It's from Dante's Inferno. Do you guys know the story of Dante's Inferno? Not the one by Dan Brown. Okay, the story of the Inferno. Um, some guy discovers the entry to hell. And there he meets the ancient Roman poet Virgil, Wegeir who becomes his guide through hell. And in hell, what he discovers is that there are nine circles, and each circle is deeper than the last. And uh, on each circle are famous people from history and literature or from Dante's own society. And each of these people are in hell because they did something bad. And their punishment in hell is related to the bad thing that they did. And there are nine levels of hell. At the very bottom level is Satan. 
And today when we think about hell, we think of burning and fire and heat. But the ninth level of hell is cold. Satan is frozen in the earth. Because his crime was to try to outshine God. He tried to be more powerful than God, to be brighter than God. So his punishment is to be stuck and frozen with no power, no energy at all. So we know that uh, Dante's divine comedy, Sun Chu, has three parts. The first part is Inferno, Di uh, Yupian. The second part is Purgatory, Lian Yupian. And the third part is Paradise, Tian Tang Pian. So as you can guess, uh, after passing through or passing by Satan, the main character enters a new place called Purgatory. In traditional Catholic thinking, purgatory is where people go after death if they have only committed small crimes. So they made mistakes, but the mistakes were not too serious. So the idea of purgatory is that you can work through your crime. After suffering enough punishment, God will let you into heaven. So in the poem, purgatory is shaped like a mountain. In fact, I think there's a picture of, of the Divine Comedy somewhere online. It's uh, descending into the earth is like a V-shape, right? And then passing through, passing by Satan, you discover a mountain, which is another V-shape. Uh, and so here Dante passes by more famous people and people from his society who made small mistakes and they're suffering, but hoping to one day enter heaven. And the higher he goes, the less serious the mistakes are. And then finally, he gets to the gates of heaven. In this poem, the gates of heaven are not an actual gate. He just starts flying. He like flies into the sky and he enters heaven. Uh, and so in heaven, he meets all the saints and all the good guys from history. And each of them describe the good things they did and how they praise God, etc., etc. And at the highest level of heaven, right before he meets God, he meets the woman of his life, the, the love of his life, who is actually a 12 year old girl named Beatrice, according to history. Uh, and so, in fact, this really fucking long poem is just about how perfect his love uh, is. The woman that he loves is. Cool. So this is from the Inferno, and this is about one of the people who is being punished. And the person says to the protagonist, if I thought that my reply would be to one who would ever return to the world, this flame would stay without further movement. But since none has ever returned alive from this depth, if what I hear is true, I answer you without fear of infamy. So this suffering person is telling the main character, I'm only telling you what happened because I don't think you will have the chance to tell everyone else. And Eliot chooses this to be his opening for this poem. The idea, I think, is of a private confession. So Prufrock is feeling these emotions, is having these thoughts that he would never share with anyone else. I think that's the point. It's a very private poem. OK, let's look at the beginning. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Etherize is the old way of uh, preparing someone for surgery. So he's comparing the evening sky to someone who has been put to sleep on a table before surgery. That's a weird comparison. What kind of sky does that look like? Um, so the point is not a visual connection. The point is an emotional connection, right? Objective correlative. So Prufrock himself feels like somebody who is about to get surgery. So when he looks at the sky, that's how he feels. And notice that he's talking to 
us, right? Proof Rock says you and I. He's talking to us. Let us go through certain half deserted streets. So half empty streets. The muttering retreats. So this is talking about if the streets are half empty and you see somebody on the street, they're probably heading away, right? They have somewhere to be. So and they're probably, you know, like uh, complaining to themselves, talking to themselves as they run away. The muttering retreats. Of restless nights in one night cheap hotels. And sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. OK, sawdust. In older restaurants and bars, the cheapest places uh, are often full of the noisiest people and like the dirtiest food. And so instead of sweeping and mopping the floor, they spread sawdust all over the floor to catch all of the drink and the food and the sauce. And at the end of the day, they can just like clean up all of the sawdust and the floor would be clean. So it's telling us that these restaurants are very low class restaurants, very cheap restaurants. With oyster shells, uh, bank. Oysters are traditionally the cheapest kind of seafood. So again, a cheap restaurant. Streets that follow like a tedious argument. <laughs> Another very interesting comparison. Tedious means tiring. It's an argument you don't want to have. A very complicated and boring argument. So in an argument, you're supposed to listen what to, to the, what the other person says and to reply to what they say. So you have to follow the argument. But here it's comparing these streets, one street after another, to a boring argument. So like you don't want to be here. You don't want to be on these streets. Not interesting at all. It's just very tiring. Of insidious intent. Insidious means uh, malicious or like secretly evil. So even though the streets are boring, you think maybe these streets are are evil. Maybe there's these streets are going to do me in. To lead you to an overwhelming question. Dot dot dot. Oh, do not ask what is it? So don't make me say what the question is. Let us go and make our visit. Um, to help you understand the poem, I'm going to tell you what the question is. The question is here, line 38. Do I dare? In other words, do I dare confess my love? So the question is, do you love me, basically? But he's so afraid that he says, oh, don't make me say it. Let's just go and see. In the room, the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. So another reference, right? Michelangelo, the Renaissance uh, painter and sculptor. So they go to visit these women and the women are coming and going and they're talking of Michelangelo. Of course, the point is not that they're actually talking about Michelangelo. They're talking about this symbol of masculine beauty and masculine energy, like a, an ideal man, which is the opposite of J. Alfred Prufrock. So already it feels like he doesn't have a lot of hope. The next stanza again describes the environment. Uh, and then line 23. And indeed there will be time. And this gets repeated on line 26. There will be time, there will be time. Now we know that he's thinking, should I confess my love? Should I ask her if she loves me? So here when he says, there will be time. 
you can see that he's hesitating. He's saying, I don't have to ask now, I can wait. But of course, there's always a limit to how long you can wait. So with that in mind, please finish the poem before next week. <laughs> 